All right, we are live. I have an exciting show for you today. We have uh, Lee Brainerd from Soothkeep, and we're going to bring him on. Today we're going to be talking, of course, about one of my favorite subjects, and that is the rapture. And we're also obviously going to be hitting it from a pre-tribulation point of view. And then also we're going to talk about the new heavens and the new earth. So I thought I would just bring him on right away and let's uh, let's jump into this. Hey, Lee, how's it going? Shane, um, I'm going great. It's a fine day to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. We got a glorious future in front of us, and I think we're going to have a wonderful conversation. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. Love it. So I thought, you know what, maybe, uh, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, why the interest, if you will, um, really when it comes to the Bible, you can really specialize in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Gospels, the Pauline epistles. Um, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I'll ask you some questions about what pegs your interest the most. Sure. Well, I was saved as a when I was in high school back in the winter of 1978-79. It was at Christmas break of my senior year in high school. I had, Our family had recently moved to North Dakota. Um, I had a dear friend in Helena, Montana that had been sending me gospel tracts and gospel literature and letters talking about Jesus. I took a vacation to go visit him during that Christmas time, got time off from work. I actually quit my job because they wouldn't give me time off. My parents gave me permission to go to Montana for two weeks. And in the basement of the uh, Catholic Cathedral in Helena, Montana, in a charismatic Catholic meeting, believe it or not, that's where I, I heard the gospel clearly for the first time in my life, and I was born again. So that was the winter of 1978. Since then, I've gone forwards with the things of the Lord. The Bible has become my very favorite book. Uh, I can't imagine living without the Bible. It is. It tells us where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going, and how to be saved. I love it. I love it. And uh, I don't know if you checked out any of my videos, but I, I absolutely love reading the Bible as well. I, I'm all consumed. And it was basically uh, because of my wife. It's her fault. It's my wife's fault. She saw that I was neglecting the Bible. My son saw it, and he blew the dust off of my Bible, handed it to me, and basically said, here, Dad, why don't you read the Bible? And that struck me. It's pretty struck me pretty hard. So I did what anybody in my situation would do is I took the Bible and I said, yeah, you know what? You're right. I put it aside, and I just continued with whatever I was doing. So my wife took note of this and then decided to pray for me over a period of 90 days. Just a simple prayer, just basically praying that I would get a hunger for his word. And then uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. So I thought, huh, this feels kind of end time-ish. So I thought maybe I, I should read the book of Revelation. So I was reading out of the New Living Translation, read it, and I'm like, huh, I don't really know much about Revelation because I hadn't read it in years. So I thought, well, a lot of the early church fathers seem to gravitate towards the book of Romans. So why don't I do that? As I was about to do that, I noticed uh, one of my old King James Bibles on the shelf, pulled it off the shelf, and I started reading the book of Romans. It took me about an hour and a half. I'm a slow reader. And then... Uh, I noticed that it was quite fascinating, the book. And so I read it again the next day. And I ended up reading the book of Romans in its entirety every day for 30 days in a row. All 16 chapters. Now I can read it in like 30, 40 minutes. But something happened in my heart after doing that. It was like a pilot light turned on. And all of a sudden I had a hunger for his word that I couldn't describe and I'm not able to put it down anymore. And it's been two years now. Amen. And I decided to create a YouTube channel 
to just to document my journey as I went along, not really knowing what my channel was going to be about. Uh, I just decided, you know, I called it originally Black Swan Diary. And uh, I thought, you know, because if, if you're in, I was also reading this book here, uh, The Black Swan by uh, Nicholas Taleb. And I yep. thought, you know what? We could very well be in a black swan event and not know it. That's kind of the criteria. If you know you're in a black swan event, then you're probably not in one. <laughs> so that's why I created my YouTube channel around that name. And I thought, I'm just going to document what's going on around me and my journey through the Bible. That was it. That's how I kind of started. So then I started reaching out to um, various people that had their own YouTube channel. And I decided I, I saw you. I, th I think you're on. I'm trying to think who the, the gentleman's channel that you're on that I saw. I watched some of it and I'm like, oh, it'd be cool if we did a podcast. I watched one of your videos on your channel about the rapture. And I went, oh, OK, he's a pre trimmer <laughs> And what you said just made logical sense to me. And I thought I I'd love to have you on my channel. So Welcome. Why don't you share your thoughts as to why, what do you gravitate towards most in, in, in the Bible and why, and then what perks your interest about uh, new heavens and new earth? Sure. Well, the greatest draw for subject matter in the Bible since I was a babe in the Lord, so that's over, it's about 45 years now has been Bible prophecy. I love the fact that the entire first coming for for nearly 2,000 years, uh, or o actually over 2,000 years, was Bible prophecy. Um, it was uh, two th nearly 2,000 years of Bible prophecy from the time of Abraham. But from Adam going forth, it was nearly 4,000 years of Bible prophecy. So then we come to the second coming, and the subject <clears throat> is very fascinating for me because the salvation that the Lord Jesus bought for us at the cross, he's going to present to us at the second coming with the resurrection, with the glorious eternity spread out before us. That's an infinite universe. That's an infinite utopia with infinite energy, infinite time, infinite resources, and infinite opportunity. And it will be impossible to be a fulfilled human being. Well, that subject on every level, uh, the last days, eternity, heaven, it just gripped me and it's it's never let go. But as I went down this path, I, I developed um, a foundation underneath of that that's really is important. And it's more important to me than Bible prophecy, even though Bible prophecy is my most common subject. And that foundation is the absolute authority and inspiration of Scripture. And it's a, the authority that we should be letting the Bible interpret the Bible rather than letting human beings interpret the Bible. Right. And it, that's a great difficulty that we face because since a babe in the Lord, I determined that I was going to hold the Bible uh, with, with such a, a tenacious grasp that I wouldn't let any doctrine or practice, uh, I wouldn't hold it so sacred that I wouldn't allow the Bible to challenge it, to modify it, to guard it, to balance it, even to overthrow it. So in this mix of laying this foundation of the authority of Scripture and how everything comes back to Scripture and how we interpret Scripture— I started getting interested in Bible languages too, which is now a very strong interest also. Because I got tired as a babe in the Lord of hearing a preacher say from the pulpit, oh, this is this Greek word is blah bitty blah, and it means blah bitty blah, and therefore <laughs> blah bitty blah. And I'm right. sitting there as a babe in the Lord with nothing but an English Bible, and immediately three or four verses come to mind which say, he can't be right on what that Greek word means and what that passage means with that meaning, because there's three or four other verses that it say it is written again. So as a babe in the Lord, I had a fire get lit in me to learn Greek especially, but also Hebrew. And that's been a passion ever since, so that I would regard myself as having expertise in Greek and competence in Hebrew. And okay. I can also use the Latin and the Syriac when I need to. 
Okay, cool. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, myself, I would say on a scale of 1 to 10, I probably know 0.000 when it comes to Greek and Hebrew. And I think part of it is because of, for me, is time was kind of against me, as in I was only reading a verse a day of the Bible, maybe, maybe yeah. a verse a day. And really in the last two years, like I, I mentioned to my audience, I, I read the Bible like 12 times. So I was consumed in understanding old English, if you will, because that's like a language unto itself. Like yes. really, when you think about it. So what I did was I also subscribed to the Oxford uh, English Dictionary, if you will, because what they've done is they've actually preserved old English words going all the way back to the 400, 600 A.D., and they're archaic in nature because we don't use those words. But what Oxford did is they said, we don't care if we don't use them. We're going to include them in our broad-based dictionary. They have like 20 volumes. It's like 650,000 words, English words. And the way they came about it was they thought, you know what, if, if there's if somebody's mentioning a word in English in a book or an article in print or whatever – we're going to include its meaning then in in the dictionary, whether or not it gets archaic. We just want to know that somewhere in history, somebody said this word. So they put it in. And that feat, I don't think, will ever be touched. It took them seven years to get from the letter A all the way to the word ant. Seven years. So they said if somebody wanted to take on that task from starting today and just say, okay, Let's look up all the English words and let's just write them out and print them out. <clears throat> you can't do it. You can't yep. touch it. It's it's it would take you forever to do it. So that's kind of for me because I read from the King James Bible. I'm kind of consumed in the old English because again, it's like a language unto itself. Heaven forbid if I learn Swahili or something else, right? Like there's so many languages, almost like pick one. So I'm glad you said that you're 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 um, what do you call it? Well researched in Greek, and then also you know you're you're comfortable enough in Hebrew. So um, I value that because it's almost like you got to pick something, and then just go hard on it. <laughs> Absolutely, you know every one of the believers in the body has a gifting and a calling. Sometimes we struggle trying to figure out what our gifting and calling is. And if you come under these ideas that your gifting and calling may be entirely unrelated to your natural gifting, um, then you're going to struggle even worse. You know, I've run into people that think, well, my natural gifting is art, but I can't imagine that God wants to use my art or he, my natural gifting is music. And I can't imagine that God wants to use that. Well, yeah. typically your spiritual gifting is in harmony with your natural gifting. Yeah, the cool. Lord just wants to take that, sanctify it, and use it in a direction that honors and glorifies him. And every believer has a gifting and a calling. And sometimes you might have two or three. But if we, yep. if we head down that channel, it's a tremendous blessing. And there's no less reward in heaven for someone with the prayer warrior ministry than there is for someone with the public pulpit ministry. There's no less reward in heaven for a woman who only reads the King James Bible and doesn't know any other languages and does her home Bible study as there is for someone who teaches Greek and Hebrew in a seminary. Right. Uh, we follow our gifting and our calling. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I like that. I like that a lot. So let's dive into the rapture. Why, why, why pre-trib versus post-trib? Why, why not just be post-trib? Well, you know, that's a great question. When I was a babe in the Lord, I actually was post-trib. And I was post-trib for the very same reason a lot of people are post-trib. I'm just reading along. No one's holding my hand. Nobody's teaching me. I come along to Matthew 24, and I see the saints, the elect of God, in the tribulation, right up until the second coming. Well, to me, that was a no-brainer, and it, it seemed real obvious. And that's the ground a lot of people stand on. They say, see, it, as long as you don't have anyone teaching you, 
you're going to be a post-tribber. Well, that's that's not strictly true. That's true that it's it's true that very frequently people that don't have anyone to help them understand the Bible will become post-tribbers on the basis of a passage like Matthew 24. But if you go deep in the scriptures and you let the scriptures teach you, uh, you could be in a prison cell without any contact from any other human beings, and you would eventually discover, oh, wait a minute, the 70th week, according to Daniel chapter 9, uh, Daniel chapter 12, um, and other passages in scripture, is designed for Israel. And you would see that it's it's designed to preserve Israel through trial, to pr- to purify her in that trial, and to break her from her idolatry and to bring her into the new covenant. I We also find promises in Scripture that if you really dive into what it's saying, like Revelation 3.10, because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which is coming upon the whole world to try those that dwell upon the earth. It Notice it says to keep from the hour. doesn't say keep through the hour or preserve in the hour. And if you're going to be kept from the hour, and that hour covers the entire globe, the only way you can be kept from that hour is to be kept from the globe. So there's yep. we have the, the dispensational argument that the tribulation is for Israel. We have the promise of preservation passages like Revelation 3.10. Those over time conspired to convince me that my original uh, post-tribulation thinking was just wrong. Now, what's also interesting about this, when I was a young believer and I was a post-tribber, I would get bent out of shape and angry when when people would try and teach me the pre-trib rapture. And I would be snarky, even sarcastic. But as soon as I was convinced of the pre-trib rapture, which was 10 years into my walk, by the way, at that moment, a peace settled upon my heart. And I was no longer cranky and ornery and angry about the subject. And I could actually have an intelligent, peaceful conversation on the matter without uh, railing against my brothers. Yeah, no, that's interesting. You know, and I think about Greek and Hebrew, like when you read Luke, I think it's Luke 21, where Jesus says, pray that you may be counted worthy before all these things come to pass, I kind of jokingly say, okay, that word before in Greek, in Hebrew, in Swahili, in just about any other language means before. That's right. It doesn't mean after. Mm. So all of a sudden, you know, my, my pastor will joke too. He'll say like, what does all mean in Greek and Hebrew, whatever, what does all mean? It means all, like you can't change that. So when Jesus is saying, pray that you're counted worthy before all these things come to pass, that tells me that is before, not after. So that's how I kind of rationalize things, right? When I'm reading it in just plain English. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, you Um, bring up a great point, brother, because I've had many, many people over the years ask me, I want to learn Greek. What's the most important tool I need to learn to Greek? Greek. What is the most critical component? And my answer is always the same. The critical component is to master the Bible in your mother tongue. I don't care if that's German, French, English, or Spanish, or Portuguese, whatever it is. Master the Bible in your mother tongue. If you don't, you're just going to use Greek to defend whatever your doctrinal platform is with all of its strengths and with all of its weaknesses. You'll be pushing Pentecostal Greek, Baptist Greek, Plymouth Brethren Greek, whatever kind of Greek there is. Um, But you, in the odds that you are going to get so deep in Greek that you're actually entering into the mind of the Koine Greek reader and speaker is extremely low. If you put decades of study into it uh, and go broad and deep outside the New Testament, then yes, you can enter into that. But if you don't, you're going to be carrying your Greek on the back of English and not vice versa. <clears throat> yep. Yep. For sure. I, I agree with that. Like it takes, it takes time just to master English. It takes time to <clears throat> write. Like I, I basically, I don't know if you know this, but I write in two languages. I write, I print and I write in cursive. Isn't that oh, yeah. interesting? 
I don't think there's another language out there that does that. Is there? Well, there have been some in the past. Most of the European languages had printing in cursive, but okay. the cursive has gone the way of the dinosaur in most of the world, which is a tragedy. Yeah, it's part sure. of the dumbing down of the entire world. Yeah, for sure. And when I'm making my notes, like I have, this is my little, I call this my swans nightly. It's all cursive. Yeah. I love it. I love cursive. I thought my hand would fall off, uh, but I literally wore out two pens writing all this stuff out. Yeah. And I have, I found a pen that I really like to write with. It's effortless and I'm lefty. So you got to be very careful when you're writing because you could smear everything. But I thought my hands would fall asleep or cramp up or whatever. But after writing a couple hundred verses, it's easy now. It's yeah. easy. And it's actually fun to just, I don't know, connect all the words and I don't know. It's just, it's something that just occupies your mind. I, I just love it. Uh, elegant cursive handwriting is one of the most beautiful things on earth. I put it in the same category as great painting and great yeah. uh, musical works like with the violin and the piano. Yeah, for sure. And that's something that I'm, I'm studying a little bit as calligraphy as well, because when I see what some people are posting on YouTube, I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. My colleague, my cursive is definitely different than their calligraphy because it's very flowing and it, it is like art. It's beautiful. It's actually yeah. just beautiful, right? So that's what I'm kind of practicing as well. Uh, but yeah, so you were post trip kind of like me. I, I think I bounced a bit because I grew up in a Pentecostal church. And it was a lot of pre-trib in there, like all the psalms, uh, or sorry, all the hymnals. We would just read from the hymnals. We would sing songs from the hymnals. You you show up to the church. You have today. We're going to be singing forty-seven, fifty-four, one hundred and ninety-seven today. Oh, yeah. you're like good, I got it. I got it right. So that's what I grew up, and then I went away and basically started. Really, probably maybe three, four years ago, I started questioning pre-trib a little bit going, hmm, it kind of feels like Matthew 24, and you hear people talking about that, that we need to get tortured as the bride. We need to get drugged through the mud in order to earn our salvation, and really we don't know if we're saved until we're saved. And I'm like, huh. If I tried that on my wife and said, hey, in order for you to earn your stripes, I need you to go through the mud, and then maybe I'll think about marrying you, she would be like, you're an idiot. You're an <laughs> idiot. So I like my wife for that purpose. She keeps me grounded on stuff like that, right? So it doesn't make sense when you look at God's character all through the Old Testament, <clears throat> specifically with Lot, specifically with Noah, Enoch. You, you get the sense that God has favor and people are doing things in a certain way that he's like, you know what, what you're doing pleases me. I have favor and I'm going to remove you before destruction comes, not make you go through it. Like, I don't understand. And, and there are some post-tribbers that are like, no, 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 uh, Noah wasn't raptured. I'm like. I understand that, that he went into a boat with his family, but the Lord closed the door and the boat rose above the water and above 30 cubits above the highest mountaintop. Does that not show you that that's kind of rapture -es? No, no. They went through the flood. I'm like, okay, okay. Like you get into an argument over the silly things like Lot wasn't raptured. Yeah, but he was literally snatched out of Sodom and Gomorrah by the angels grabbing his hands and his two daughters and his wife, pulling them out saying, we can't destroy this place until you guys are safe. Yep. Doesn't that seem like God is not destroying <clears throat> the righteous with the unrighteous? Doesn't that show that? And they're like, yeah, but that's different. And they're like, oh, okay. All right, I see where we're going with this. But yeah, it's it's kind of bizarre how they try and twist things in the Old Testament saying, no, 
that's that's not what you saw or that's not what you read. And I'm like, it's right there in the Bible. Yeah, uh, to me, the, the fact that we are going to be delivered from the coming trials, the coming judgments, the coming wrath is a tremendous blessing. I like to tell people, hey, okay, fine, I'll let you have the ark, but we get it too. The fact of the matter is, the, the distinction between the time the church goes up in the heavenly ark and the time that the first group of Jews are going to be sealed to go through the tribulation in the tribulation ark, there's only a few weeks or a few months. There's not that much difference. It's, it's the same days of Noah, and yeah. it's the same delivering God. And in both instances, it God seals the church in the ark and takes them up. And the, the Jews that God is going to seal and preserve all the way through the tribulation, like the 144,000, yep. they don't seal themselves, folks. God yeah. seals them. He delivers them through. Yeah, that's but a good point. But the fact of the matter is, um, some of this material in the Gospels fits both a pre-trib deliverance and a through-the-trib deliverance. And yeah. we, but I think the problem is, People start with the assumption there is no pre-tribulation rapture. And yep. so when they come to something like Noah, or they come to something like Lot, they refuse to see there's any pre-trib analogy here. They refuse yep. to see a pre-trib picture here. Yeah. But, but the fact of the matter is, it if the only let, let's just take Noah's picture. Yep. Let's assume Noah goes all the way through the flood in the boat. And he lands on dry land, and as soon as he gets out and he opens the hatch, he comes out in the deck. God grabs him, snatches him up, hauls him up to the clouds for a few hours, and then brings him back down. Well, you'd scratch your head and say, what was the purpose of that? Going to the clouds yeah. was it was an escape of judgment. Um, if, if you go all the way through the tribulation, preserved in the tribulation, there is no rapture. There's no... Yeah. You know, you can't say that that while the gathering of the saints in First Thessalonians chapter four, he gathers them to the clouds and then they go sideways to to Israel rather than going upwards to New Jerusalem. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. Because John 14, very clear. The next time the Lord Jesus appears physically yeah. to the church, he takes them to yeah the courts in New Jerusalem. So this whole resistance to a pre-trib rapture, it's not really an exegetical issue. They're yeah. not really trying to be honest with the scriptures interpreted by the scriptures. They start with the presupposition that the pre-trib rapture is false. Yeah, I I agree with that. And it and it feels like like you touched on it a little bit. <clears throat> People get angst for some reason, get angst at the idea that Jesus Christ can come back when he wants to versus he cannot come back at all starting today for at least seven years. He cannot. It is yeah. illegal for him to leave his throne and come back here. Therefore, you have that time to do whatever you want because you know in your head you have seven years. Yeah. It's kind of a weird little, and they get mad at you for saying, look, I really honestly, I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. I That's don't right. know. I don't know. I I would like to, but I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. And I don't know if Jesus is going to come back tomorrow or tonight. But I live my life as though either one of those could happen. That's today right. or tomorrow. I, I can't worry about a week from now. It's not like I'm not living for now and all this. I'm planning a men's retreat in May. We're organizing all this kind of stuff. We're plan we basically mapped out the whole year for our men. I'm I'm in charge of the men's ministry. We have like 200 men in our church. So we mapped it all out for the year. I'm still living for this year as though it's gonna. We're going to make it to 2025. I have no problem with that. Amen. But if he comes tonight, yippee. Amen. Awesome. If he comes 10 years from now or whatever, because people, the more you say 
he comes down the road, 10, 20 years, people get angry at that too. So I'm like, oh, okay, I won't oh, stretch my. it out. I'll just be like, what if he comes 10 years from now or whatever? I'm okay because I got work to do today. I'm okay yeah. with it. And I love the Lord. Maybe there's a good chance I'll have most of the the Bible memorized in 10 years from now. I don't know. I'll, I'll really understand my Bible 10 years from now. That's kind of how I look at it. Should he tarry? Amen. The way I approach it. So You're right about people getting upset on that whole issue. There's There are people that get upset because you think the Lord can come any moment. And I've had this experience too. It's like, no, we can't. Uh, well, folks, we are so deep into the stage setting for the tribulation. Yeah. There, there's no reason to point to anything that says we need to see this, this, and this happen. Yeah. None of these things had to happen when we're already this deep into it. Yep. We know it's close. We just don't know how close. Yep. I've I've had people though in in recent past where I challenged ideas where people thought we have to go up this year and they'd give X, Y, and Z reasons why we have to go right. up this year. Right. And I'd say, well, I, I hope we go up this year. I, I don't have one complaint if we go up. But right. I'm not going to be a bit surprised that we're here a few more years. There, there's yep. nothing. Imminence yep, sure. says just as much we might be here down the road as it says we might go up today. It's a two-edged yep. sword. Yep. And people don't like that. Uh, no. They sure don't. <clears throat> we don't. We don't know where we're, again, we don't know unless you can promise me that you know where people are going to be tomorrow. Yeah. Like we don't even remember where we were three days ago. So what are, why are we arguing about what I'm going to do next week when basically the easiest way is the Lord willing? Why do people say the Lord willing? It's because we don't know what's going to happen a week from now. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or whatever. So why not? There's enough stuff to think about today why am I consuming myself with stuff tomorrow? Like my plate is full today. Yes. I'm full. <laughs> yes. And we have a command in the scriptures to occupy until he comes. This yeah. means be occupied until he comes. Yeah. I, You know, we should be living every day as if he could come today. Yep. But this is not a paradox. We yeah. also should be living as if he might not come for another five or 10 years. Yeah. We should be living both at the same time, living the life with our human obligations and responsibilities that yeah. God has given us yeah. in a balanced position. And, yeah. and it's just funny how most Christians are incapable of being balanced. I think it's because there's too much influence by the world and not enough by the Lord himself. Yep. No, for sure. hundred percent. And you can get caught up on that. And I'll be the first one to say, I love solar eclipses. I love it, but I'll be honest. Anytime I looked up at a solar eclipse, it was like, uh, it's not really anything. Cause I can't really see it. Cause it's not coming over top of where we are in Canada. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's like, when you watch all the images and everything, you're like, oh, wow, I'm going to see the biggest sun and everything. But you almost have to be like right under the exact area in order to really appreciate it or whatever. But there are a lot of people that are leaning on the side of this, the end of the world yes. as we know it kind of thing. And I'm like, uh, well, you could wake up on April 9th and they could be nothing at all. And I've talked about that in videos, but it could also be a precursor to something as well that could happen, you know, especially with earthquakes, all kinds of stuff. We don't have no idea what man could do, what's coming. Like there's all kinds of moving parts and stuff, but I don't lose any sleep over it. Yeah. I'm like, I'm filming it on that day with a buddy that has a bunch of telescopes, we're going to try and watch it from here and we're going to live stream it. And he's going to share his perspective of when he looks at this star and all this kind of stuff. Cause he's kind of a stargazer. He has, he buys and sells telescopes and all this stuff. And he's a friend. He's a Christian friend. 
if we're here. If we're here, we're going to do that. That's our plan for that mm. day is to just talk about it, talk about the rapture and talk about, oh, yeah, it's kind of cool, whatever. And then at, I think, 2 o'clock, we'll wrap it up and then continue. That's kind of the plan, you know. It's just it's yeah. something fun to think about, fun to talk about. But there's also stuff going on in our world around us. We got mortgages to pay. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Kids, you know, I have a grandson. I want to see him grow up to be 18 years old. This isn't me wanting to escape from the earth, yep. but it is a gorgeous escape plan. I have no problem with it being an escape plan. People get mad at that too. They're like, you're trying to escape from destruction on the earth. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. I I want to escape before... God's wrath gets unleashed on the earth. Yeah. And I like to, I like to tell people that I think it's a tactical extraction. Yeah, and love it's it. <laughs> a tactical extraction when the church's uh, job, she's finished her commission. She's finished yep. her mission. But the world is changing and we're going to come bumping right up against that change. Yeah. And the Lord needs to change the play the the uh the battlefield rules he's going to change the rules of the game for the tribulation yep. but yep. he has to remove the church which is with the heavenly calling out of the world because if he didn't yep. what's being set up by the new world order by the deep state would completely crush the church so it's yep. a tactical extraction yeah when he moves after the church age he takes the church out he moves into the tribulation He's changing the, the rules of the game that he's going to be playing by. He's moving from a heavenly economy to an earthly economy. He's back to uh, to wholesale miracles, not occasional miracles. He's yeah. down He's down to uh, real prophets, not prophets in a secondary sense. Um, yeah. he's, he's down to Moses and Elijah here on earth, 144,000. It's going to be the yeah. greatest display of supernatural power on earth from, since the beginning of the world. Yeah. And so the tactical extraction has to happen so that Lord can the Lord can move into that plan. And it's yeah. going to be exciting to watch that. Can you imagine watching prophecy updates every day in heaven while we're sitting around in the front of the big screen TV drinking heaven bucks coffee? <laughs> That's funny. Heaven bucks. That's funny. Um, <clears throat> I kind of look at it like in World War Two, Pearl Harbor. Yep. Basically. Japan had ambassadors in the United States and they yep. were they were arguing back and forth saying, well, this is we need this. We need that, whatever kind of thing. And then it got to a point where the ambassadors were called home. That should have been a bit of a wake up call whenever ambassadors have to leave for some reason. Oh, I got to go home. I need to take the flight out. That tells you the communications have broke down. That's right. Basically between the two countries. So if we can understand that in society going, okay, if an ambassador gets removed, that tells me war is imminent. Something is coming. I feel that's the same way. The ambassadors are being removed from the earth. Not saying the Holy Spirit is gone because the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. But we're almost, I feel like we're rolling back to the Old Testament, how the Holy Spirit would work that's in right. individuals. individuals. Right yep. now, we have the Holy Spirit in us, teaching us, guiding us every step of the way. So that's how I approach it. Like, well, just look at what happened with Pearl Harbor. They, Japan removed its ambassadors and then Pearl Harbor got attacked. Yeah. So that's almost what I feel. We're being removed. Now the Lord can go into the next chapter. Amen. Amen. So let's 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 dive into a little bit about uh, new heavens, and new earth. Yeah, I love the subject of the new heavens and the new earth. It's a huge encouragement to the believers, whether you're talking to the believers of this age or the believers of the prior age or the believers of the coming age. They have a glorious future to look forwards to. Right now, we live in a sin cursed earth, in a sin cursed world. And I look around at this world and I see how beautiful nature can be when it's cursed. Can you imagine living for all of eternity in a universe and on a planet, Earth, 
that's not under the curse and that it's always at the peak of beauty and it's always at the peak of natural glory. Hard that's to imagine. We, that's, that's what we have coming. Yes. You know, to me, I love fishing. I know I don't get to do much fishing anymore. I think the last time I went fishing was six or seven years ago uh, on a backpacking trip in Montana, but I love fishing. And I can remember trips as a kid and trips as an adult where we were at mountain streams and mountain lakes in Montana, where the fishing was so good that you'd get tired of catching fish and you'd have to oh, go wow. find something else to do. Wow. I've also had times where I spend hours on the water without getting a bite or a strike. Well, in the glories of eternity, there'll be no such thing as a bad day of fishing. There'll be no <laughs> such thing as a bad day in the garden. There'll be no such thing as a bad day in the art studio. It just yeah. won't happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be glorious. No, it's interesting that when you think about Jesus after his resurrection, that it almost seemed like that's one of the first things that he did was fish. Yes. He had yes. a couple of fish. He's cooking up some fish. And I'm like, that's kind of interesting that you're, you're basically telling your disciples to basically throw the net on the other side and all of a sudden they're full of fish and Peter pulls the net to the shore. That was, I think, the 153 fish or whatever, or maybe more. Um, and then when they sat down, Jesus has, he's already cooking fish. Yeah. So where did he get that fish? He might have been fishing for all we know. Yes. Might have been fishing there. So it's interesting that that pleased the Lord. And Absolutely. So there's there's kind of little types and shadows of stuff to come that I, I think if we can enter into that even right now, the mindset today, like I've I've shared with my audience, <clears throat> there are some things that we can't take into eternity. And this might sound weird to say, but hope, you can't bring hope into eternity because we'll be with him. Uh, you can't bring prophecies into eternity because we're there. That's right. Uh, you you can't believe you can't bring in tongues and all this other stuff because you're there. It's going to be totally clear now. You're yep. you're actually talking with him right now. It is like we're go looking through a glass that's that's basically blurred a little bit, where we can't see everything fully. We can't fully understand everything. But that's also because we're in our fleshly bodies right now, and one day we will know everything. But the only thing that you can carry into eternity is our love. That will not go away. Our love for him, our love for the church, the, the body of Christ to edify the church. We can transfer that love into eternity for billions and billions of years. Yes, that's right. No, I like that, that presentation there. We're not going to take sin in. And we're not going to to have anything that's a part of the fall or the curse. I, you know, I love the thought that we won't need to have hope there. And we'll. Yeah, it sounds weird. Life. It sounds weird saying it. We're not going to have hope in heaven, but you, know, we only have hope because of things that are not seen. That's right. That's why that's we right. have hope. If you have it, you don't have hope now because you got it. So, that's right. <laughs> you know what I mean. So it's kind of. It's a play on words, but it's it's actually so I try to live in eternity right now today. Well, and that's a great blessing if we can learn to do that, because if you try and find fulfillment in this life, what you're going to find is nine hundred and ninety nine people out of a thousand are not really going to find a fulfillment of their dreams in this life. Unless somehow you water your dreams down over the years and tell your dreams are just to actually own a house and a car and that's your dream. Uh, maybe you can accomplish that. But the fact of the matter is we all have dreams and ambitions as a human being that we just simply do not have the time, the money, or the opportunity to, to experience in this life. If we set all of our hope on the glories that are going to be revealed to us when the Lord Jesus comes, the glories yep. of eternity, then every human desire and ambition that you've ever had that's not intrinsically sinful, it's simply intrinsically human, you yep. will get the opportunity to fulfill that and a thousand things you've never thought of. Yeah. in eternity. So yeah. if we set our hearts on eternity, we're we're setting our heart on a situation where it's impossible not to be fulfilled. If yeah. we set our heart on the things of this life, we put ourselves in a position where it's almost impossible not 
to be disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And it's like, okay, what's the difference today then? Let's just say tomorrow we entered into eternity. Let's say I passed away tomorrow. Yeah. Sounds weird to say, but let's just say that happened. <clears throat> what is going to be different for me than right now? <clears throat> I have all things right now. Yeah. It's like the prodigal son where uh, when the son returns on his way in, the brothers, like the older brothers, like, um, I think what he was thinking was, does this mean this is going to tap into my inheritance? Yes. Because he right. squandered his. He's got nothing. Now I'm like, a little bit concerned that maybe my piece of the pie, my inheritance is going to be taken out. What about my friends? I wanted the lamb for my friends. Yep. And what did the father say? He said, everything is yours. That's right. So when is that everything? I believe it's right now. I'm not talking about Lamborghinis and Porsches and all this kind of stuff. I'm talking yep. about we can experience eternity right now because he has given us everything. And he tells us not to worry, not to lose sleep, yep. but to trust in him. So if you can enter into that rest, what are we arguing about again? Yeah, I think it's a blessing that we, you know, we're we're not aiming for eternal life. We already have eternal life. The scriptures yes. say you have eternal life. Yes. Now, there are certain aspects of that eternal life that are going to be manifested in the future. But in the meantime... We we already are heirs of God. We just yep. haven't been given given our inheritance yet. But we are heirs of yep. God. I just want yes. you know, if we can enter into that, what that is so mind blowing is so mind boggling. Yes, yeah, just just and I think that's what I tapped into after reading Romans like thirty times in a row. I'm like, okay, so what you're telling me is you died for us on the cross one time. Yes. Okay. You're not dying again. No. So I'm a joint heir of Christ. Yes. Okay. So I'm eternal. I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. God Amen. justifies us by what his son did, not what anything that I did. Before I knew anything to do good or bad, he died for my sin. So are you telling me that I can't out sin your grace? Yes. Because what will happen is you'll probably die. <laughs> that's that's it. Your flesh will just die. But you can't out sin, my belief, his grace because it's abundant. It's he, he has a gift that keeps on giving. It's not like Adam. Adam gave us one gift. Thank you, Adam. We die. He did one action, whether he took of a fig tree or whatever, or an apple tree or a banana tree, whatever it is. That one action caused all men to die. So now the last Adam comes in. And because of his one action, all men live. And it, it keeps giving. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Like if I mess up today or tomorrow or yesterday, we're still forgiven. Amen. Like we're not going to put him again on the cross again and again and again. He's not going to die again. So why not? Why not just appreciate what he's done for us? And if you get into that point where you're being tempted, why not run into his arms instead of looking where that edge is? That's right. Amen. And that's a that's a perennial struggle that believers have is we go through life, we find discouraging situations when we're discouraged, we're we're drawn to our old sins. I mean, when Peter said I go a fishing, he he was discouraged. I'm yep. going fishing. Yeah. Well, we don't always fall to something as as uh Neutral is fishing. If we get discouraged, we might be tempted to anger. We might be tempted to other forms of sin that we thought we had victory over. Yep. It's important in our spiritual warfare to, to keep short accounts with God, to yep. walk with him, to walk in the spirit, to continually be going to the word, the cleansing of the word, and yep. continually going to the Lord in prayer. If we don't, we're going to let that problem fester. And then we're going to see things appearing in our life that we thought that we had victory over. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I kind of, uh, I mentioned the idea that that Paul uncovers 
he basically unlocked the code to dealing with our flesh in Romans seven. Yep. And I, and I just say, you know what, our, our job is basically mm. to leave our flesh in a coma, put our yep. flesh to sleep and don't say stupid things that wake our flesh up like commandments, if you will. Like I learned quickly, <clears throat> I'm not going to make a promise. Like I swear every day I'm not, I'm going to read my Bible for 60 minutes, one hour every day. I swear, because I know what happens. I'm going to be tossing and turning at night to make sure that I get up so that I don't fall asleep tomorrow. And then all of a sudden now I got to read the next day for two hours. That's right. And I'm starting to defeat myself instead of just saying something like, well, what if I just tried to get to know the Lord a little bit better today than I did yesterday? Yep. How about that? And now you put your flesh back to sleep, nighty night, go to sleep, go to sleep. It's just, just, you could stay asleep. I am legally not bound to you at all. You, I don't have any legal responsibility to you whatsoever. I'm married to Christ. And same thing goes with porn. If I say, I swear, I will never look at porn. I swear I will never look lustfully onto a woman. Well, I'm waking up the flesh. How about instead we say, I wonder if there's something I can do today Amen. that could bring myself and my wife closer <clears throat> together today. What if I took her out on a date? What if we went for a walk? What if I made dinner or did dishes or what, what can I do to enhance our marriage? That's a whole different thing than saying, I swear I will be the best husband on the planet. Well, you're just you're waking up the flesh. Let's let's keep it asleep. Put it in a coma. Nighty night, choke it out. Put it to sleep. Give it a pillow. A little soother. A little warm milk. Good night. <laughs> it is interesting the principle that you're bringing up. I've learned myself the hard way, and I think people tend to see this after they get a few years of Christian experience under the belt. Is that? You are going to have a far greater degree of victory if you learn to walk in grace and in love than if you try and walk by the law, which is trying to maintain rigorous standards. Yep. I've, I was in a church as a young believer where we had, I mean, if you were going to judge a church by its standards on paper, it doesn't get much better than what we had. Mm -hmm. um, but. I mean, you know, standards about being separate from the world and and not being worldly, and it was it was pretty decent stuff. There's a little bit of extreme there, but typically when people get exercised over the ungodliness of the world, there's always a temptation for extremity. But we discovered that we had great um, ambitions and great desires. But it was an unattainable standard and much less a maintainable standard. But I have yeah. observed that when people don't take up these rules and regulations for their standards and they just live the crucified life with Jesus Christ and they walk according to the principles of love and yeah. they let the love of Christ fill them with flames and they let the grace of God fill them with flames. Yep. You will climb higher on the mountain of yep. holiness than rules and regulations would ever take you. And when you go up the mountain with rules and regulations, it becomes a burden like the yoke of the law that no man could bear. Your rules yep. will become a regulation to you that you cannot bear. Yep. And then you'll feel guilty when you forsake them. Yep. But if you climb that mountain simply filled with fire and desire for the things of God and for the Lord Jesus himself, you won't even notice how hard it is. And yeah. you, I don't know if you've ever sang the old hymn, tell me not of heavy crosses nor the burdens hard to bear. Because once you are going on the path of love and devotion, yeah. Those heavy crosses don't seem like heavy crosses anymore. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. And that's the secret that Paul was trying to uncover in Romans 7. He was unlocking it and telling us how to deal with the flesh 
And if we can learn to live in that, like, like if you think about it really just simple, if I'm loving on the church and the body of Christ, and I'm like, I worship one God, I love the body of Christ more than myself. Tell me what commandment I'm breaking. Yeah, that's right. There's, there's nothing that I'm doing wrong. And you could do that unlimited. You can yes. keep loving on the Lord more and more. You can keep edifying the church more and more. There's no law that's going to come against it. So if you're kind of fulfilling the law by loving the neighbor as yourself and you worship the Lord your God, what are we, again, like, why are we making this more complicated? But it took me like 52 years to figure that out. It yeah. really did. And my church that I grew up on, it was a crime against humanity to go to a dance as a teenager. Oh, yeah. It was a crime against humanity to go to the movie theater because that's where the devil lived. So it perked my interest to go to a movie theater. It started to perk it, and I'm like, well, why is this so bad? And then you go, and then, yeah, you see some bad movies. But now I'm like, okay, you know what? How about I just guard my heart and guard my eyes? Yes. You know, how about I just do that, focus on that? And then all of a sudden it's like, if I see a movie on the weekend, I'm going to be – it's hard to get through a movie now, I'll be honest, because I'm more into my Bible. But – if I watch a movie 15 minutes in, there's something there. I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. I don't need to skip through it. I don't need to fast forward. I'm done. So that's kind of how I've gotten to now, whereas people used to say, oh, you're a movie buff and all this kind of stuff. But now I guard my heart. I guard yeah. my eyes every time. That's easier for me to say, don't watch any movie the rest of your life. Yes. As soon you know, as another... I say, well, go ahead. I was going to say another thing that goes the same path is simply when we look at David's example, he's yes. a classic example that a good offense is the best defense. If yes. David had been on the battlefield where he should have been, he wouldn't have fallen with Bathsheba. Yep. And so often as a believer, if we have something that we're interested in, throw yourself into it for the work of the Lord. Does it yes. matter if it's evangelism, Bible yep. studies, discipleship? just calling and encouraging people, letter writing yep. ministry, prayer ministry, find something you love to do, music, art. Yep. Do it with all your heart under the Lord. You are yep. going to be so busy. You'll wake up thinking about it. You'll think about it all day long. You go to bed thinking yep. about it. Yep. You, you will find that that will do more damage to your temptation to sin part of your life than anything yep. else you could do. Be yep. inflamed with the vision. Yeah, and and I used to dream at night of movie scenes. Oh, like yeah. I'd watch a movie and then I'd toss and turn going, oh, yeah, that actor did pretty good in that job, whatever. But you're thinking about it. You're reminiscing about scenes, maybe old flings, old flames, whatever it is, but you're not capturing your thoughts. And what I found was when you read the Bible and you immersed yourself in it, almost yeah. drowning yourself in it to your eyes bleed, that all of a sudden I found at night I was uh, I was recalling scripture in my head as I was dreaming. Amen. My mind was piecing things together when I was heading into rapid eye movement. And I'm like, oh, that's what Paul was saying over here. And then that means this. And then you're sleeping peacefully, but you're you're piecing things together. And now when I read the Bible, it's like I'm reading a movie or I'm watching a movie. Yep. Scene by scene, I don't see letters. I don't see words anymore. I see surroundings. I see landscapes. And it's like, it's very hard. Like, I, I can't read fiction. I can't. I can't read it because I, I, I like I like watching science fiction just as the best as any anyone else. But it's very hard now because I'm into the Bible to be like, well, why would I read the fiction when I could just read my Bible and I'm like, I'm there in that story. Yep. I'm there where King David is and all this. It's like, I'm watching a documentary unfold before my eyes. Amen. And I love documentaries. I absolutely love documentaries, but the idea of it become coming to life, it's almost like you're there when you're mm -hmm. reading the Bible. And that's, 
something that people didn't tell me two years ago. They didn't say, oh, if you read lots, you're going to tap into uh, reading it almost like you're reading a movie or like you're reading some novel or whatever. It's just going to captivate you and you won't yeah. be able to put the book down. There is a spiritual level to reading the word of God that is not there when we read other books. And the, the, the word of God yeah. is intimately connected to the Holy Spirit in such a way that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. Yep. And so whenever we're in that word, the Holy Spirit has his hand on the hilt of that sword and he's doing his work in us. 100%. And when we're using it in gospel preaching or discipleship or encouraging or warning, whatever we're doing, the Holy Spirit yep. is also there. You know, yep. it's, it's impossible for that word to return void, whether it's working on your heart or somebody yep. else's heart. 100%. It, it, it can. And, and it just reminds me, like, we just finished having Easter. And when you think about Jesus Christ, he didn't give up the spirit until everything was finished. That's right. Like, so that tells me that whatever was said in the Old Testament couldn't go void until he finished his work. That's right. And it's not void. That Maybe that's not the right word, but it's like everything was fulfilled. That's that right. he came to accomplish. And once that was done, he gave up his spirit. That uh, gives me hope. Yes, yes. And there's a blessing in that too for us. I like to tell people that until your work is done, you are invincible. You are unkillable. Yeah. You are immortal. Yeah. Um, now, you can hinder that whole thing by sure. moving into sin and then falling under judgment and be called home early. But sure. if you're if you're walking forwards in any kind of relative devotion to the Lord, you are not going to go home until your work is done. Yeah, I, I agree with that because uh, I kind of hinted at that with Paul. And this sounds weird to say it, but I don't think he could have been killed until he finished all his Pauline epistles. Yeah. Giving well, when, to you, us. when you read through Paul, you realize escape A, escape B, escape here. There's the same thing we see at the Lord Jesus, where there was times that they were going to kill him and he just slipped through the crowd or he yep. just e evaded ex yeah. in, in their capture. Yeah. And the Lord works that way in our lives too. Yeah. And Paul, to me, by all, if you just read Acts, he should have been killed several times. That's right. Several times over and was killed. <laughs> like really he was stoned to death and they left him for dead and they're all standing around him going is somebody gonna give him mouth to mouth or do we have something that we could get his heart go and then he sits up it's like yep. wait a minute what he should have been dead finished but i don't think god's purpose was done yet for That's his right. life and jesus said i'm gonna show him what it takes to suffer as well a little bit so it's kind of interesting, maybe because of Stephen, don't know. But it's like this guy was shipwrecked. He was beaten like a rented mule. He was stoned. He was whipped. Everything. Chastised. And that's not even what he had to deal with inside the church. That's right. That's just outside the church. So I feel like we can hold on to that and go, we occupy until he comes back. And he has a plan for us right now today. But if you're going off doing your own thing, it's not that you're going to get unsaved. It's just that you're going to die a little bit quicker in your whatever it is that you're doing, your foolishness, whatever it is. And again, I'm not saying I'm perfect. People go, oh, are you saying you'll never sin again? No, I'm saying I'm forgiven. Amen. I'm forgiven. That's that's the difference. So I just don't want to run to that line anymore. You know, the imaginary line where you're like, where is that line of no return? I don't yeah. care. I don't want to go there. I've been there. I don't want that. I don't like it. So I'm going to go this way into his loving arms instead. Amen. Yeah, if we can uh, cultivate the the word-inspired, spirit-inspired practice of yep. going as deep into the light as we can instead of trying to straddle that gray area line, yes. we will bring ourselves more happiness, more fulfillment, and more contentment. You know, it's a struggle for me to watch Christians who are unfulfilled and you're trying to get them to open up and you'll discover that 
they're seeking happiness and fulfillment, but they're seeking it in unhealthy relationships. They're seeking it in unhealthy institutions and situations. They're seeking it in things that they shouldn't be seeking it in. And they're just struggling with discouragement and discontentment and lack of fulfillment. And I just want to encourage people, hey, just go as deep as you can into the things of Jesus. Go as deep as you can into the light. The yep. more you go down that path, the more your heart is going to be at ease. You'll have peace that passes understanding. You'll have joy the world cannot give and cannot take away. Yep. And it will be a tremendous blessing. You'll even sleep better at night. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I love that. Here, Here's a little, I want to get your, your input on this. Dusty Bible leads to dirty life. Agree or disagree? Oh, or what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Either the word of God is going to keep you away from sin or sin will keep you away from the word of God. Yeah, and that's what I found in my life when I wasn't reading the word of God. All of a sudden, I was in things that I shouldn't have been involved yep. in. And I couldn't do both. There was something about the Bible that I'm like, if I'm reading that, it's going to convict me. Yeah. So I'm going to put it aside and everybody's going to think just because I move it around a little bit, maybe they'll think I'm reading it. I'll even leave it open on the table. Mm. Maybe they'll think I read it until my son called me out and said, Dad, there's like this much dust on your Bible. There's no way you're reading it. I open up the pages and they're sticking together because it's so brand new. There's no highlighter in it, nothing. So that convicted me. I'm like, well, what about the opposite? Why not immerse myself in the Bible? And then if there's something where I have a thought, like now I 100% believe I can capture every thought into my mm, mind, yeah. every thought I capture. I couldn't do that before. I'd be like, oh, that's not a bad thought, huh? And I'd start thinking about it all day and I never get anything done. But now I'm like, okay, there's a foreign object. I'm like, what is that? Oh, that's not good. And I give it to the Lord. Amen. Right away, as soon as it comes into my head, it's not the thoughts that come in. It's what do you do with those things? So I'm like, yeah, that's that's not of the Lord saying that I'm unworthy. I can't contribute to society, blah, 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 all the stuff. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't believe that. And then you dive into the scripture. Amen. Well, you know, the, the word of God is a tremendous blessing. We read about the washing of the water of the word in, in Ephesians. And we reread in the Psalms, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. And that works for young ladies too. Yeah. The word of God. If you if you have something in your life and you just are not sure how to deal with it, how to get victory over it, go to the word of God and go to prayer. Yeah. Yeah. If you have something that you've been struggling with for a long time, can't get victory over it. The answer is the same. Go yeah. to the word of God and go to prayer. Between the Word of God and the Spirit of God, there isn't a problem that you face that God doesn't have an answer for. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. That's awesome. So I mentioned to you before we started that we have about an hour. I don't know how much time you have. Like, I got all day, but I want to yeah. respect your time as well. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or anything? Like, if there's something we missed or whatever, um, is there something that you want to... Yeah, I would just like to encourage people in the study of prophecy. That's kind of where we started. Yeah. Seems to be like the theme. Yeah. You know, there are some questions about Bible prophecy that are going to be a struggle for you. If you're a babe in the Lord, you might not even understand the difference between believing that there's going to be a literal kingdom or that there won't be a literal kingdom. You may not understand uh about the difference between is the church going to go through the tribulation of Matthew 24? Are we going to be preserved from it? I want to encourage you, don't pull the hair out of your head over yep. these. Just relax and just yep. start studying the scriptures. Yep. Let the word of God take you by the hand and lead you. Um, it might be a while before you get them figured out. That's okay. You're yep. going in the right direction. You know, if you get this one thing right about Bible prophecy, you've gotten the cream off the top. And that's this. 
if the, the cream is that the Lord Jesus is going to come back down here, he's going to clean clean this world up. He's going to drain the swamp. He's going to carry the trash out. And this world is going to be what he wanted it to be. And if you're going in that direction, serving that Lord, then then that's fine. Just keep pressing on. But stay in the word. I do believe if a person puts enough time in the word, he's going to understand that there is a literal coming thousand year kingdom. The Lord Jesus is going to rule on earth. And I do believe that they will eventually see that the Lord's going to take the church out of the world before the tribulation. And then he's going to deal with Israel and give them the same new covenant blessings in Jesus and his blood that we have right now, except that Israel gets it attached to earthly promises like the throne and the temple. uh, And we get it attached to heavenly promises, but just stay in the word. And if these are not clear now, don't worry about it. Just keep pressing forwards and keep studying. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So, I want to encourage everyone to go visit your channel, Soothkeep. And do you have a website as well? I do, soothkeep.info. .info, okay. So go there, check out his channel, watch his videos. And uh, I hope to have you again on as a guest on my channel. I really appreciate you. Oh, I'd love that, brother. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And is... You mentioned that you're also working on a book right now, or you're finishing up a book, or I got two books. I'm work- actually I got three books I'm working on, but two of them I'm going full steam ahead on. Okay. The first one is the the final volume of my Planets Shaken Prophecy Fiction series. Okay. Which is very different than most fiction. Most fiction just takes and writes a fiction story and throws a little right. gospel in it or a little right. prophecy. Right. I took a core of information on Bible prophecy the history of catastrophism since the flood and cutting edge Bible cosmology. They all cast light on Bible prophecy. Yeah. And then I wrote a story around that and I'm working on the fourth volume right now. Right. Other book I'm working on is 10 powerful pre-trib rapture proofs. Okay. Awesome. I, I, I just realized I said, I don't read fiction. It's not that I don't want to read fiction. It's just that, I've been so consumed in the Bible. Maybe I'll read your book (laughs) when it's done. It's it's interesting about my book, the Planet Shaken series. The first one is called The Rogue, and they're all available on Amazon. Okay. I've had people that as a principle, they're preachers and missionaries who don't read fiction by principle. Yep. I've had some of them read my books. Yeah. And it's the only fiction they've ever read. Yeah. And they got they said they got more solid Bible prophecy understanding out of my book than they did out of many of the prophecy books they read. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And uh yeah, like I have a son, like he reads Dune, he reads all these books that are like this. Yeah. Like they're just huge, right? So we're always trying to have a conversation about it. And uh I think Red Rising was another series that's all about Mars and stuff. And my nieces and nephews were all reading it and they're trying to get me to read it. And I'm like, it's just so much detail in the first 500 pages just to get into the colony and all this. And I'm not used to that. Like, it's like learning another language when you read a science fiction book about Mars or something. It's just, it's time and energy. And I'm like, "Ah, I feel like I'm only scratching the surface on the Bible. Amen. So that's the only reason why I'm gravitating here is because I I feel like I've I was in starvation mode for the past 20 30 years and now I'm gobbling it up and now I'm starting to understand how I can control my mind for the better. I'm Amen. just starting to grasp that and I'm I'm fascinated by that and again I I really appreciate you being here on this channel. And uh, are, wh- where are you going next? Where's your, your next place? Where are you off well, to? We're taking off this week. We're going to go south to Oklahoma. Okay. Um, from there, I got to catch a flight to Denver. I'll okay. be meeting up with Pete Garcia. We're doing a special meeting in nice. the Fort Collins area. Then I fly back. Awesome. Then I'm going to go catch the eclipse in Texas with Mondo Gonzalez. Okay. And That's it. That- that's funny you mentioned Pete because that's I think that's where I actually saw you on you're on his show yeah. and uh, you and him were talking and 
here's a, a short little story about Pete Garcia. I think he watched one of my videos on maybe I was unpacking something in Roman seven and he said he watched my video and then he started sending people to my channel. And every day I would see in the comments or something, Pete Garcia sent me Pete Garcia, Pete Garcia, Pete Garcia. I'm like, who's Pete Garcia? Like, I don't know who this guy is. So I emailed Pete and I'm like, thanks for sending people to my channel or whatever. I said, Maybe we should do a video together sometime, you know? I'll have you on as my guest or I'll have you or maybe I can come on your show as a guest or whatever. So we're trying to figure things out. And then finally, I was able to go on his show. But it's interesting how small the world is. Yes. And how big it is at the same time where you can... You could know people are are like you could you could hear of people through other people and they're like, hey, do you know this guy? I'm like, no, nope, I didn't even know he existed a week ago. And then you watch him and you're like, oh man, this is a great brother in the Lord. And I love Pete Garcia. I think he's awesome. Yeah. So so that's cool. You guys are doing that. That's that's awesome. Will that be? I was gonna say, will that be televised or will that be put on YouTube? Uh, the the Fort Collins meeting with Pete. Yeah. It's going yeah. to be uh, live streamed and it will be put up on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. What would be cool. Do you know Tom Cody? I, I know Tom, but I, we're not, I mean, I think we follow each other in YouTube channels, but we've never yeah. done anything together. Yeah. Never done anything there. Okay. The only reason why I mentioned that is I thought it'd be kind of cool to have you myself, a couple of other guys, on the channel one time, I think that would be fun to get together. Like even if it's just you and Pete or someone else that you guys know, it'd be kind of fun down the road to have almost like a round table. I'd love to pick your guys' brains. Yeah. Well, if you get something going that direction, let me know. Okay. I will. I will for sure. So thanks again. I really appreciate it. I'm going to take off. Got a couple of things to do as well. Um, I do have some little video projects that I do for my church, uh, from time to time as well. Like we're doing a little mini course. Um, so yeah, but thank you. I appreciate your time so much. This has been awesome. We'll do this again. hundred percent. All right, brother Shane, you have a good day. Awesome. You as well. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So that was fun. That was fun. I, I hope to do something again with Lee. He's a busy guy, busy guy to get a hold of. And uh, so, um, what do you call it? Just so forthcoming. And he just, he's so genuine. You could just tell by just uh, interacting with him. And I love having guests like that. I, I honestly feel like I could go all day talking to Lee because uh, he knows scripture as well. And I, I appreciate that. Um and I think that's that's what the benefit of having a YouTube channel is, is sometimes on a Sunday morning, you can't always have a guest on because you're preaching for 30, 40 minutes, and then you got to kind of wrap it up because people have things to do, places to go. But on YouTube, you could go for an hour, two hours all day or whatever. So I just want to say thanks to you to my audience for actually watching the show today. Appreciate it. And you guys have a fantastic time. I'll see you later.